This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Chances are you've never been to this place, sunny Los Angeles, 1967. It's warm, bright, and a continent's length away from Atlantic Canada's piercing winter winds. In California, the air smells of orange blossoms, and the sun rises over the waves each morning as if in salutation. The past is but a faint memory. It is here that the Saturday Evening Post columnist Joan Didion will publish her first collection of essays, Slouching Towards Bethlehem. Bethlehem was Didion's first nonfiction book and, despite the popularity of her columns, a bit of a gamble. Still, it turned out to be perhaps the most influential essay collection of the last century, or ever. Today, an endless list of writers emulate Didion. She is the author most encountered in creative writing courses. Her language is tight, impeccable, and precise. What exactly, asks Didion, are you trying to say? But there's something we forget about her. As Nathan Heller noted in his New Yorker article, What We Get Wrong About Joan Didion, style is just the baseline of good writing. Didion's innovation was something else. It doesn't matter if you write in present tense, avoid adverbs, and replace all your filter words. No one wants to read another nepotism baby cry about his breakup at the Chateau Marmont. Impeccable prose ruined by palpable privilege. A real writer degrades herself. Didion wrote, my only advantage as a reporter is that I am so physically small, so temperamentally unobtrusive, and so neurotically inarticulate that people tend to forget that my presence runs counter to their best interests. And it always does. That is one last thing to remember. Writers are always selling somebody out. Whether the writer or the subject, somebody needs to be on the cutting board. We don't just want style, we want a darkly comedic and complicated confession. There's something salacious about desperation, and there's something pure and profound in unmitigated vulnerability. Relatable, enviable, genuine, human. That's what we're hungry for, the nasty bits. It's common practice to let confessional writers' voices take up undue space in our minds and hearts, especially in a time as lonely as now, parasocial connections seem to hold more weight. But this form of thinking, as uncomfortable as it may be, isn't new. And it's one Didion practiced as well, notably in her classic essay, John Wayne, A Love Story. We went to the movies three and four afternoons a week. And it was there, that summer of 1943, while the hot wind blew outside, that I first saw John Wayne. Saw the walk, heard the voice, heard him tell the girl in a picture called War of the Wildcats that he would build her a house at the bend in the river where the cottonwoods grow. As it happened, I did not grow up to be the kind of woman who is the heroine in a western, and although the men I have known have had many virtues, and have taken me to live in many places I have come to love, they have never been John Wayne, and they have never taken me to that bend in the river where the cottonwoods grow. Deep in that part of my heart where the artificial rain forever falls, that is still the line I wait to hear. As Didion did with Wayne, I tell you this neither in a spirit of self-revelation, nor as an exercise in total recall, but simply to examine specific aspects of celebrity worship that I believe deserve harsher scrutiny. I spent 2021 consuming a life's worth of Anthony Bourdain's writings, shows, and interviews. Any fondness I hold is, of course, parasocial, a figment of my own imagination amplified by the silence of now. Nonetheless, I find I miss his voice being a part of the cultural landscape. If I were half the writer Didion is, I would immortalize the feudal despair of this admiration, and the admiration of many, the way she did hers. But perhaps all I can do is miss him instead and say just that. I miss Anthony Bourdain. Many of us do. But missing someone you've never met comes with consequences, and it's these consequences that make all the difference. Bread with schmaltz and onion. If you're not Jewish, you probably don't know what that is. Rendered animal fat, my friend. And you might as well call it love because it's that good. Don't you be so happy. You know, 
you're just wearing your pajama top and no bottom. <laughs> you know, you go over to the stove, you, 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 you throw a case of grind into the, into, the, into, the, into the pan, and you're, come on, you've never cooked bacon while naked? <laughs> come on. Who hasn't? Am I the only guy? <laughs> Anthony Bourdain, to those unfamiliar, was an American chef, author, travel documentarian, and activist. After dropping out of a degree in literature at Vassar, Bourdain attended the Culinary Institute of America and spent many years cooking in some of New York's top kitchens. But his real celebrity began in 1999. While head chef at Layol, a popular New York brasserie, he sent his essay, Don't Read Before Eating This, to the New Yorker as an unsolicited submission. Against all odds, they published it, launching him to stardom at the age of 43. Good food, good eating, is all about blood and organs, cruelty and decay. It's about sodium-loaded pork fat, stinky triple cream cheeses, the tender thymus glands and distended livers of young animals. It's about danger, risking the dark bacterial forces of beef, chicken, cheese, and shellfish. Your first 207 well-fleet oysters may transport you to a state of rapture, but your 208th may send you to bed with the sweats, chills, and vomits. Although this essay has become a modern classic in foodie and general fiction circles, Bourdain fanaticism exploded with his early television appearances. He brought wit, charm, and humor in spades. The American public fell in love. How are you all taught to handle rude people? In the back of the house, uh, very undiplomatically. That's why they keep us in the back of the house. <laughs> That's the waiter's job. <laughs> So it's a dance to get the food to the table, presented in a way, and it's hot. Yeah, the, the good-looking dance is out front. The not-so-pretty dance is in the back. Okay. More like a mosh pit. Oh, my. <laughs> he got a book deal and penned Kitchen Confidential, his first memoir, which was an instant bestseller and received critical acclaim. And I still associate the taste of oysters with those heady, wonderful days of illicit late afternoon buzzes. The smell of French cigarettes, the taste of beer, that unforgettable feeling of doing something I shouldn't be doing. I had, as yet, no plans to cook professionally, but I frequently look back at my life, searching for that fork in the road, trying to figure out where exactly I went bad, and became a thrill-seeking, pleasure-hungry sensualist, always looking to shock, amuse, terrify, and manipulate, seeking to fill that empty spot in my soul with something new. I like to think it was Monsieur Saint-Jour's fault, but of course, it was me all along. He was one of the first popular books to show what really goes on inside of a professional kitchen. Passion, profanities, ego, and failures. Some say it was the very first popular book in the genre, but I think that honor actually goes to White Heat, Marco Pierre White's 1990 cookbook that arguably made celebrity chefs happen by making them look, you know, sexy. One look at these very famous black and white photographs shows how this happened. I don't know if I can adequately convey to you the impact that white heat had on me, on the chefs and cooks around me, on subsequent generations. Suddenly, there was life pre-Marco and post-Marco. But although I'm relatively new to the genre, its clear kitchen confidential has left an unmistakable mark and is the most popular memoir in this bad boy confessional chef genre. It holds a special place in the minds of many, it's the name of the popular subreddit, R Kitchen Confidential, home to the largest online community of food service professionals. It's the third most recommended book in the Goodreads food category. Bourdain was a master of style and brevity. His writing is curious, irreverent, pitifully honest, and idiosyncratic to a fault. In attempting to emulate this style to a limited degree in parts of this essay, I've done myself a disservice. But what else is new? Kitchen Confidential landed Bourdain his first television show, in which he traveled the world on a quest to find the best meal. It had always been his dream to travel, and straight away, his dreams came true. That's when his writing interests shifted from kitchen to travel. For the rest of his career, Bourdain became obsessed with capturing the human condition in a semi-journalistic and semi-anthropological documentary form. His thesis, although it shifted a bit over the years, was that, at the end of the day, every human being enjoys a good meal and that perhaps through recognizing these little similarities, we can foster communication. You go to a place like Beirut, and you find yourself talking to a Muslim woman. If you're a journalist tasked with an agenda, you know, you're, you're there to report a story, and you come right out with it. You're going right into some very difficult areas. Whereas I have the luxury, I'm there to eat. Presumably I'm there to eat, and I'm asking very simple questions. What makes you happy? 
What do you like to eat? Where do you like to go and to get a few drinks? You know, what do you miss about the place when you go away? And I find again and again, just by spending the time, by asking very simple questions, people have said the most astonishing things to me. It's a romantic notion, one that resonated with many. Bourdain wrote more books, most of them non-fiction, notably Medium Raw, The Nasty Bits, and A Cook's Tour, and starred in several more television shows. It was a prolific and exhausting career. A few highlights, of which there are many, include his trips to Vietnam, one of his favorite places in the world. I do not believe in love at first sight. I think you could make a case for a love at first smell, and the smells of Vietnam. It's quite, I mean, it's unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. Episodes filmed here are pure joy. He rides scooters, soaks up information on local history and culture, and smiles so hard it must hurt, devouring clam rice or any hot bowl of noodles, perhaps the type of food he treasured most. Fellow travelers, this is what you want. This is what you need. This is the path to true happiness and wisdom. Once I spent time in Vietnam and got used to spicy noodle soup for breakfast, that ruined American breakfast for me forever. I, I could really never go back to eggs and toast and you know, home fries and all of that. I mean, it just, it just ain't right. So you think you can make this back home when you go back? No. You're just going to see food this ingredients this fresh. For me, you need to eat this outside like this. I like the sound of the motorbikes. I don't want to eat this in a dining room with a, you know, chairs and a carpet. And you have to come here. There's his visit to Iran, one of his longest awaited destinations. The locals welcome him with open arms, and he learns that Iranians are some of the most generous hosts in the world. Of all of the countries I've been to in all of my years shooting travel television, me and my crew have never been treated so well every day by average people in the street. People were lovely to us. He is killed with kindness, as he put it, feasting on delicious home-cooked meals like... And here we have kufte, which is a large, very big meatball. Kufte tabrizi, ground beef, onion, and cooked rice. Walnuts, dried apricots, boiled egg, and barberries. Most importantly, he makes friends, who tell him they would love it if the world could know that they are human beings. Not intrinsically evil, just people. You see this tortured relationship between America and Iran for many years. How do you think most Americans will react when they we would see this? Start coming. <laughs> <laughs> Touching and hilarious mealtime anecdotes abound. Soup so spicy, yet satisfying, that he wonders if he's actually a masochist. I absolutely love the chasha shuli, a stew of slow-cooked veal with onion and tomato, heavily seasoned with coriander, fennel, garlic, and chilies. Spicy? I mean, it's really, like, it's got some good zing in there. Yeah. Feeling better? I am. Good. The squirrel pie, arm wrestling, and duck hunting in the Ozarks that he described as a really great time but I would be remiss not to mention his greatest love of all. Pork, my favorite vegetable. Oh yes, the pork chop bun. The product of genius and a distinctly Macanese creation which will live in history. Oozing fried pork chop between delicious bread. Oh God, that's good. But fact is, you didn't think of it. They did, and Lord, how good it is. Well, I think we learned something today. Pork, good. Pork on sandwich, better. He delighted in Spam Sushi in Hawaii, but his favorite food of all was blood sausage. Mustamakara, Sunde, Kishka, Sargamba, Morcia, you name it. If the menu offered blood sausage, he was in heaven. A house specialty is the obscenely good boudin noir, one of the very best things on earth. Oh, it's beautiful, just the way it's engorged with blood. No double entendre necessary. A dish so ancient and primeval, you can taste the whole history of pleasure in every bite. So you have a little marmalade of onion, we have a mashed potato, celery puree. Deep, dark, and gorgeous. Soft yet slightly resilient at first, you cut and it gushes across your plate. Blood and onion and spice. Sublime, yet somehow ever so slightly evil. Mm. See, I don't know whether you should get the Nobel Prize or be arrested for this. It's fun to watch him have a blast, but it can be even more fun when he gets fed up. 
Never take Bourdain for a fool. Never confuse quality with price. Some of his best scenes involve him getting indignant and passive aggressive over expensive, dainty little cakes and pastries. One minute miserable at a confectionery in Vienna saying something like, this is hands down the worst day of my entire life. There's one thing we never do, you know, it's like sort of anathema on this show. It's, it's go to the home of the original anything. And I pull up at the door here and there's the big sign that says, home of the original soccer torque. Well, that translates generally to Tony, stay away from here. And the next drinking absinthe with a stranger and saying, now this is good, wholesome fun. I can't believe they trust you with the mugs. You get two, that's what the two euros is from. The what? The, the two euros. You bring that back, you get two euros back. It's 380 or 580. Oh, really? I get a rebate? You get two, you get two euros back when you return it. Or you can keep it and bring it home. I get two back? If you, unless so you I can basically go take his and, and I can make some money. Whether culinary expertise, unapologetic boldness, or just plain social skills, Bourdain's television appearances radiate a certain je ne sais quoi that I simply lack. What American bands do you hate? Definitely, uh, yeah, um, Creed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they are like the worst band. <laughs> the font of all wisdom is oozing out of that plate. I would stick a blunt knife in your neck for this cheese. I would make this my little Kurtz's compound only slightly more luxurious and more Danish modern. They can point to him and say, you know, Anthony Bourdain lives over there. His methods have become unsound. It is rumored that he's gone over the edge. No one's seen him for some time since he moved to that island. I do like that shower head, though. Cabrales? I love it. I, I, I do really no, love Cabrales. Cabrales. This is really lovely. And you know one thing? It's full of penicillin, man. Nobody gets ever sick if you really eat these cheeses. I feel my syphilis clearing up. <laughs> Man. All right, God. If this were the kind of martial arts movie he always loved, and life would be so much cooler if it were, I'd summon the ghost of Anthony Bourdain and find some way to prove myself worthy of his mentorship in kitchen and prose. Most likely brutal tasks of conditioning and spiritual grit, like chopping onions until my eyes bleed. But alas, life is not a movie, so I bought his books and binged his shows instead. What a way to quarantine. Now, don't get me wrong, Anthony Bourdain was not always on his best behavior. He was a deeply flawed human being, as we all are, and his reputation as the bad boy of the culinary world wasn't totally unearned. A few episodes of his shows have glaring blunders, sometimes even in their premise. Take this episode of No Reservations centering on Detroit, Michigan, an episode many anthropologists claim glorifies the mythology of the American dream. An American dream that never existed, a mythology that, when depicted, should not be treated as fact. Mistakes were made in the production of his other shows as well. The fault lies, as we'll later see, not just with Bourdain, but he has historically taken most of the responsibility for these blunders. It has often been noted that many of the locales Bourdain visited later became tourist traps, and therefore his attention robbed them of authenticity. There are consequences. You know, we try to, we try very hard to slip through places to do no harm, you know, to leave us as, as light or non-existent a footprint as we can. But the fact is, there are all these unintended consequences. That's an obvious one. And a less obvious one might be, I go to a rice farmer's home with my small crew, no lights, no sound guy. We don't want to freak people out. We don't want people behaving un unnaturally. We try to be good guests. But the fact is, we've come in and we've put this rice farmer on TV. How do his neighbors feel about that? That might cause some friction. We've seen that also. Academics who have similarly examined his work to analyze the post-colonial narratives employed therein have their criticisms. A 2019 study by Tedros Workney and H. Leslie Steves illustrates that Parts Unknown, in particular, struggles against and sometimes falls victim to tropes of cultural brokerage and colonial nostalgia. Bourdain's unique uses of hybrid and inherent cultural brokers, his self-reflexive style, and his efforts to historicize and contextualize African locations indeed separate parts unknown from other culinary adventure programs and from most other reality programs in Africa. Bourdain offers a fresh and highly likable and engaging style. Nonetheless, we disagree with others 
who conclude that Parts Unknown provides a counter homogeneic narrative of Africa and should stand as a model for the rest of the travel show genre. As Bourdain painfully confesses in the Kenya episode, the Parts Unknown stories in the end are his, those of a privileged white western chef and a reality television host, not those of people living in his various destinations. No narrative adjustment can erase that reality. Who gets to tell the stories? The answer in this case, for better or for worse, is I do. And ultimately, the problem with me writing this episode is that I am similarly a privileged Western content creator. No narrative adjustment gives me the full understanding of any of the places Bourdain visited, nor can I reliably gauge his impact on those places. But as you'll see, that's one of the recurring themes of this essay. He was not perfect. We go to a small, struggling business that's really cool in a remote part of the world. It's the greatest bar ever. Just locals go. We put it on television. Suddenly all these tourists are showing up. It's not the same anymore. Um, so look, we think about those things. We try to do right. You, you learn over time. Uh, but there is something destructive about the camera. Here is where his story gets tough to tell. In early 2018, Parts Unknown was filming in Strasbourg. Bourdain, who never missed a meal, was not present for dinner nor breakfast. A concerned friend found him dead in his room. His death was ruled a suicide, one that shocked the world. World-renowned chef, best-selling author, award-winning host of Parts Unknown, and our friend, Anthony Bourdain has died. CNN's Kate Baldwin teared up as she reported on her colleague's death. Every time he'd walk off set, I'd always, I'd always shout at him as he was walking off. I'd say, in my next life, I'm coming back as Anthony Bourdain. And I, I wonder, is that why it's maybe so hard to process this today? Upon his death, an outpouring of memorials graced the world unlike nearly anything seen before for an American celebrity. At the time, I was serving as the North American ambassador of my school's International Students Association, and many friends and acquaintances of mine, from Ecuador to Vietnam to Turkey, expressed intense grief. It seems many communities internationally, and especially American diaspora communities, remember him fondly. I've made it a goal on this channel not to stigmatize nor pathologize victims of suicide. Suicidal ideation feels inescapable to those who've ever experienced it. But it's also important to remember that recovery is possible. In fact, most people who think about suicide do recover. Treatment and intervention work. And I miss him. We miss him. A lot. Anthony Bourdain was not perfect, far from. And the thing is, there's nothing wrong with that. This isn't a call-out video. This isn't a video in which I say, Anthony Bourdain was bad, actually. This segment and this video generally will elaborate on Anthony Bourdain's flaws and legacy for three main reasons, among others. Firstly, being imperfect and not knowing everything was kind of his whole ethos. His writings are all about being the person in the room who knows the least, consistently learning, growing, transforming, and reevaluating. So this idea that Anthony Bourdain was the pinnacle of good ideology, a flawless role model, that's not really the message you should be taking away from what he made. Secondly, idolizing celebrities does virtually no good. It accomplishes pretty much nothing but setting oneself up for pain. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, idealized celebrity images and narratives can quickly become a form of idol worship. In consumer and tabloid culture, those who aim to profit off of someone's name and likeness will simplify someone's narrative to nothing more than a caricature in order to sell them as a product. That's essentially what celebrity is. But in death, this practice becomes more dubious. No longer is there even an illusion of implied consent. A dead person cannot consent to being sold as a product. We'll get to all of that later. For this segment, I want to examine Bourdain's posthumous reputation as a wholesome feminist. A few weeks into editing this video, the world lost Joan Didion. 
I recently read through one of Anthony Bourdain's Reddit AMAs and learned that he was a huge Didion fan as well. He listed the White Album as one of his favorite books and once remarked to Business Insider, I wish I could write like Joan Didion. I'm grateful to have read both of their works in formative years, but for the record, it would be dense of me to suggest that Anthony Bourdain represents to me exactly what John Wayne did to Joan Didion. John Wayne, A Love Story, is about how a small part of her still pines for a man to take her to that bend in the river where the cottonwoods grow. I, conversely, am... I'm not perverted. I get good grades. I go to church. I'm a cheerleader. Let's just say I don't wish for a man to take me to the bend in the river where the cottonwoods grow. And yet... Didion's longing resonates with me because I do still hope, despite myself, that a man exists who is unlike the others, fundamentally. Some platonic ideal of a good man. The golden retriever boy. The himbo. The best boy. By wife energy. Twitter's white boy of the month. Men that give the energy of having been written by women. The masculine urge to be a good person. It seems that every week there's a new kind of man on the internet, each one better than the last. This new man is more wholesome than his predecessors. A sexless improvement on a seldom seen masculinity. And so, as the world opens up again, I go on a quest. A quest for a good man. A quest to answer once and for all, is a good man really so hard to find? Is there such a thing as a good man after all? Or are there just men? Bourdain's work centered on being critical of public figures, popular narratives, and himself. It involved constantly discarding and revising his own beliefs and adhering to few, if any, ideologies in a strict sense. One of the biggest stressors in his life, if not the worst, was his status as a beloved celebrity. That said, he did near the end of his life begin to publicly identify as a feminist. An increasingly popular narrative is that Bourdain ended his life because of feminist guilt, and because he later recanted endorsements of abusers and machismo writings. Starting in 2016, Bourdain met and dated Asia Argento. When in 2017 Argento reported to The New Yorker that she was a survivor of Harvey Weinstein, Bourdain supported her. Look, I've seen the way Asia has been treated. It, it is disgusting and dismaying and discouraging. You understand why people don't report these things. When you see what even now, today, what people say, what they would have said on day one and what they are saying all these years later when women find the strength to be honest? Uh, of course it makes me angry. Let's be fair, who could stand up to that? Nobody did for 20 years. You just don't feel like anyone is going to do anything but punish you for telling the truth. I had to ask myself, particularly given some things I'm hearing and the people I'm hearing them about, why was I not the sort of person that these women could feel comfortable confiding in? I see this as a personal failing. What is wrong with me? Why was I not the sort of person people would see as a natural ally here? Bourdain regretted his own naivete. Being from a liberal background, not unlike mine, he believed in the restaurant industry as a form of meritocracy, a place where skills mattered above gender and sexual orientation. It's no excuse, but when I arrived in the restaurant business in the early 70s, it was in a largely gay, very sexually free, libertine-esque environment. I was coming out of a mostly women's university where men were a tiny minority. I found myself in an environment where gay men, gay women, straight men, straight women, we all spoke about their sex lives, what they liked, what they didn't like, how they fucked up, how their failures. I found this very liberating and refreshing. Kitchen Confidential contains several passages in which Bourdain praises the women of the restaurant industry who act like men, and I quote, tough as nails, foul-mouthed, trash-talking. He talks about attending Vassar as a part of one of the first classes available to men so that he could be surrounded by potential romantic partners. In Provincetown, he falls in love with the restaurant industry when he witnesses the kind of insane sexual escapades everyone's getting up to. There's an anecdote up front about a staff member having sex with the bride at her own wedding reception, an act so primal and morally questionable that he can't help to be in awe of the nonchalance with which it's performed. The book was praised for emanating the same kind of roguish, masculine prose writers like William S. Burroughs, Ernest Hemingway, Hunter S. Thompson, and Jack Kerouac excelled at. I'm biased because I tend to enjoy that kind of thing. Sorry about it. 
I loved Kitchen Confidential's unrepentantly masculine hypersexuality, but it's not for everyone, and it arguably hasn't aged well. A lot of media dodges the subject of being attracted to women, admiring women even. So here comes Anthony Bourdain writing about knives and oysters and the urge to, I don't know, sexually liberate uptight bookworms, and unfortunately, I'm sure it must have been refreshing as hell at the time because it still is in many ways. At least, it's very easy to see how he acquired a faithful audience of bookworms and queer women, despite sexist undertones. Upon the memoir's publication, and for years afterward, Bourdain was perceived as a party animal, a bro's bro. It was in this way a relatively unknown New York chef who treasured evenings spent reading and writing, who'd been married to one woman for 20 years, found himself labeled as the bad boy of the culinary industry. If you pay attention, You'll notice that the sex jokes in his early shows are usually at his own expense, so rarely at the expense of women. His language is self-deprecating, rarely objectifying. And yet, if you're a bro's bro, you'll observe this alone. Bourdain got laid and partied hard. It was a persona born of insecurity and romantic self-mythologizing. And it was a persona Bourdain got tired of fast. Look, I never wanted to be part of bro culture. I was always embarrassed. But I accepted when the book came out that I was the bad boy. There I was in the leather jacket and the cigarette, and I also happily played that role or went along with it. Shit was good. People said a lot of silly things about me. People actually used the word macho around me. And this was such a mortifying accusation that I didn't even understand it. However fast and however hard I tried to get away from it, the fact is that's what my persona was. As time would prove, this was not the genuine Anthony Bourdain. He later referred to Kitchen Confidential and that period of his life as obnoxious. He rejected gifts of cocaine at meet and greets and was known to tell off fans who were disrespectful of his sobriety. His persona shifted to travel writing and being a dad. My daughter loves to make uh, ratatouille because you know, she loved that rat in the movie and she gets to He's a knife, which fills me with terror that makes her very happy. But the rebellious image never fully disappeared. I am a guy on TV who sexualizes food, who uses bad language, who, who thinks our discomfort, our squeamishness, fear, and discomfort around matters sexual is funny. I have done stupid, offensive shit. And because I was a guy in a guy's world who had a, celebrated a system, I was very proud of the fact that I had endured that, that I, that I found myself in this very old, phallocentric, very oppressive system. I was proud of myself for surviving it. For his last few years of life, Bourdain focused on advocacy in various forms. He criticized tourism industries and American imperialism. He himself half Jewish sparked controversy by speaking out against human rights violations in Israel. I'm very, very honored for this award, the Impact Voices of Courage and Conscience Media Award. There was, however, very little courage, and one would hope an ordinary amount of conscience at work at producing our Israel-Palestine episode of Parts Unknown. I was enormously grateful for the response from Palestinians in particular, for doing what seemed to me an ordinary thing, something we do all the time, show regular people doing everyday things, cooking and enjoying meals, playing with their children, talking about their lives, their hopes and dreams. It is a measure, I guess, of how twisted and shallow our depiction of a people is, that these images come as a shock to so many. The world has visited many terrible things on the Palestinian people, none more shameful than robbing them of their basic humanity. People are not statistics. That is all we attempted to show. A small, pathetically small step towards understanding. He spoke out against sexual harassment in the culinary world. He cut ties with Mario Batali and criticized John Besh. You know, when Mario Batali's story came out, and then other chefs came out, and these, these were people who he regarded as friends, uh, and these are people who, you know, in a nuanced world, people struggle to understand that may still be a friend. Look, no matter how much I admire someone or respected their work, I'm pretty much Ming the Merciless on this issue right, right. now. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not in a forgiving, uh, forgiving state of mind. I mean, that shit ain't okay. <laughs> Okay, well, obviously it's not good he choked his wife. Wow. No, 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 no. I wasn't trying to make some bold statement or anything. It's just that choking your wife is bad. He shamed Quentin Tarantino for being complicit in Weinstein's abuse through inaction. He hosted dinners for accusers, cooking and entertaining while they convened and organized. 
he was an excellent ally in many respects. But again, he wasn't perfect. If I ever found myself with a group of guys and they started leering at women or making, hey, look at her, nice rack, I was always so uncomfortable. I felt ashamed to be a man and I felt that everybody involved in this equation was demeaned. I was demeaned by standing there next to things like this. They were demeaned for behaving like this. This is a fine sentiment, but I've also been the woman in a room full of leering, overtly misogynistic men staring in contempt at the one guy there who I thought might stand up to his friends. In my experience, the inaction of the self-proclaimed feminist can hurt more than the action of the misogynist. And just about every man who self-identifies as a feminist has done this, sat flustered, averting his gaze while his friends engage in abuse and harassment. And while I applaud him for admitting to engaging in dehumanizing behaviors, I must remind myself that he spent most of his life sitting in the room, nursing his personal embarrassment. He's not like other men, you see. He's, well. I'm a special kind of white guy. I self-reflected and I want to be an agent of change. So I am going to use my privilege for the good. Very cool way to go. And we all know that for as self-deprecating and self-aware as Bo Burnham presents, he does not decide to, and I quote, shut the fuck up. And there's only one thing that I can do about it. While, while being paid and being the center of attention. There are parallels to be drawn between the two in their advocacy and the praise they have received from it. Both have admitted to being part of the problem, but these admissions hold more weight in public perception than them being part of the problem. Specifically, both men have been declared feminist icons for the act of admitting their sexist behaviors. Everyone loves a male feminist. It turns out the problem with feminism all along is it just wasn't men doing it. We're much less shrill. Yeah, this is truly a great day for women everywhere. Now and then videos pop up on my TikTok for you page declaring a list of celebrity men that could be trusted with your drink at a party. And much to my dismay, the list usually comprises of YouTubers who make funny, innocuous videos. Videos that make the viewer feel safe and comfortable by design. I call out to you from behind the curtain. I've met and worked with male YouTubers and entertainers. There's just a bunch of average men back here. And I bet if you asked, many of those guys would agree that the fanaticism is too much. But there is an alarming level of infantilization involved as well. And I can't help but wonder if it has arisen due to what Vox writer Constance Grady calls aspirational wholesomeness, a cultural phenomenon that praises the small beans and cinnamon rolls among us. Honey made Teddy Grahams, everyday wholesome snacks for every wholesome family. Honey made, this is wholesome. It's a bit difficult to trace exactly when wholesomeness became the masculine ideal. According to Grady, in the 90s through to the Bush era, the word wholesome was considered, quote, a stale signifier of evangelical morality, usually associated with nostalgia, so-called family values, a yearning for the conservatism of the 1950s, and a dog whistle for sexual purity. But by 2014, when BuzzFeed added their wholesome category and those honey-made ads aired, connotations had shifted. Or had they? Grady points out that aspirational wholesomeness became a cultural ideal shortly after the rise of the alt-right on the internet. Friendly, warm, and supportive content, Grady argues, was a refreshing alternative to the aggressive, obscene, hostile, for the lulz troll behavior of the alt-right circa 2014. As much as I value her efforts to chronicle this phenomenon, I'm not sure I agree with this conclusion. We are still living in a heavily cynical, irony-poisoned era. Sincerity is not the ideal nor cultural norm as any Disney or superhero movie shows. And 2014 was especially Whedon-y. Don't know if I'm elated or gassy, but I'm somewhere in that zone! This scenario is called The Ravagers, led by Yandu Udanta. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know how this machine worked. The word wholesome remains politically charged, and its history as a conservative dog whistle can't be completely disregarded despite the word's colloquial use on the internet. The rise in aspirational wholesomeness, I'd argue, is not solely a reaction to the alt-right, it is the result of it. The conservatism of the 2010s, especially on the internet, often centered on a longing for traditionalism. From the Roman Empire to look what they took from you meme accounts to trad wives as a phenomenon. What's interesting to me is that Anthony Bourdain in no way epitomizes the traditional ideal of wholesomeness, being a brash, outspoken, sexually explicit, substance abusing, often rude and blunt person, yet the label so often finds its way to him. 
This isn't to say that those traits can't exist within a kind, generous, thoughtful person as he seems to be, but the traits that made him and keep him popular are not aligned with traditional wholesomeness. Wholesomeness has become a fluid, nebulous label. In that vein, just as there is a gendered double standard in perceived wholesomeness, it's important to see that there is a pernicious undercurrent of racism in this phenomenon as well. There are plenty of black men, indigenous men, and men of color in general who are just as eligible as these white men to fall under the label of wholesome, if not more so, but receive a fraction of the idolatry, if any. As becomes obvious with the celebration of male comedians, whiteness is equated with wholesomeness, likely due to the word's origin within right-wing conservatism. Look at John Mulaney, Chris Pratt, and Gus Johnson, three men the internet once adored and now dislikes. Mulaney was often praised for being a quote-unquote wife guy, who dressed in a suit and tie, did a Netflix original using the aesthetics and format of an after-school special, and delivered his jokes in the tone of a mid-century radio announcer all while recounting his history of addiction and partying. Wholesome. Johnson presented himself as a sweater-wearing Midwestern boy who loves his grandmother, yet had made several vines and short YouTube videos with racist undertones. Wholesome. And Chris Pratt was essentially beloved for playing two lovable characters, Star-Lord and Andy Dwyer, neither of whom reflect who he is in real life because, of course not, he's an actor. Wholesome. But of course, all of these men, and many more, have fallen from grace due to actions in real life that the internet deemed not wholesome. I do have to wonder if I've developed an intrinsic distrust of aspirational wholesomeness as a reaction to it. Is this why I perceive indecent, problematic figures like Anthony Bourdain as more honest than your average celebrity who puts on airs? Do I like Bo Burnham more for facilitating his own semi-ironic crucifixion in songs like Problematic? In examining his status as a feminist icon, we do also need to dive a bit deeper into Bourdain's relationship with Asya Argento. Unfortunately, nearly all information available is invasive, speculative, posthumously reported by tabloid organizations like the Daily Mail for clicks, and fodder for severely right-wing conspiracy theorists who believe that Anthony Bourdain was murdered for attempting to expose Pizzagate and or the Illuminati and or Jeffrey Epstein. No, really. What's a conspiracy theory that you a thousand percent believe in? I'll that Anthony Bourdain was used as a body double for Epstein's death. Here's the facts I can provide you. Bourdain met Argento while filming the Rome episode of Parts Unknown, later hiring her to direct an episode in Hong Kong when their scheduled director fell ill. Chapter one. To fall in love with Asia is one thing. To fall in love in Asia is another. Both have happened to me. He also fired his longtime cinematographer, Zach Zamboni, after Zamboni had a disagreement with Argento. He later posted a picture to Instagram with Argento and a new cinematographer captioned the Dream Team. Bourdain also decided not to retire in Vietnam and planned to move to Italy instead. Some friends expressed concern that their relationship was unhealthy and that Parts Unknown could not function if team members felt disposable, but others felt that a change of environment and personnel was long overdue and would positively impact Bourdain's mental health as well as Parts Unknown. Two months after Bourdain's death, the New York Times found that Argento had paid $380,000 to Jimmy Bennett, who claims Argento had assaulted him when he was 17 years old. Allegedly, Bourdain contributed some of his own money to help pay him off. A child actor who had once played her son in a movie, Bennett claims that Argento had served as a mentor and a mother figure to him, and that when she sexually assaulted him years later, it was emotionally devastating. This revelation led to the unraveling of sorts of the original group of Weinstein accusers. Argento denied the reports in a statement to reporter Yasher Ali, saying, I never had any sexual relationship with Bennett. I was linked to him during several years by friendship only, which ended when, subsequent to my exposure in the Weinstein case, Bennett, who was then undergoing severe economic problems and who had previously undertaken legal actions against his own family, requesting millions in damages, unexpectedly made an exorbitant request of money from me. Bennett knew my boyfriend, Anthony Bourdain, was a man of great perceived wealth and had his own reputation as a beloved figure to protect. Anthony insisted the matter be handled privately, and this was also what Bennett wanted. 
Anthony was afraid of the negative publicity that such a person whom he considered dangerous could have brought upon us. Many felt that this statement placed blame on Bourdain for these events and how they were handled, and Argento's claim that she and Bennett never had a sexual relationship appears to be contradicted by photos that later surfaced of them in bed together, as well as text messages detailing their encounter. Overall, it's a shit show, one that has unfortunately thrown into question the legitimacy of accusers and sexual assault industry-wide, especially when those accusers are young men. Unfortunately, the sheer act of me making this video glorifies the idea of one good man. Even picking Bourdain as the subject shows that I still hold on to some shred of hope that this special kind of white guy exists. This is my bend in the river where the cottonwoods grow. One divine moment in which a man speaks, and there is no mistaking his intentions. He sees women as human beings, completely and utterly. There will be no history of setting aside to acknowledge in the first place. Even his history seems right, for it is no history at all. Nothing to intrude upon the dream. Right now, nothing else matters but women's stories of what it's like in the industry I have loved and celebrated for nearly 30 years and our willingness as human beings, citizens, men and women alike, to hear them out fully and in a way that other women can feel secure enough and have faith enough that they too can tell their stories. We are clearly at a long overdue moment in history where everyone, good-hearted or not, will have to look at themselves. The part they played in the past, the things they've seen, ignored, accepted as normal, or simply missed, and consider what side of history they want to be on in the future. Let's go. Bourdain spent most of his days on the road and filming, over 250 a year. While filming No Reservations, during which he would spend up to a week at each location, he also filmed The Layover, which had an even shorter filming schedule of about 48 hours. His was a daunting schedule, with almost no downtime. I know that free time is bad for me. If I have a lot of time to stare at the ceiling and think about the mysteries of the universe, it, it can be self-destructive. We're visiting major cities in the US, Asia, and Europe for only 24 to 48 hours. But Bourdain insisted this was the way it should be. To many, it seemed a charmed existence. He got to travel the world, eat food, go to parties, and get paid to do it. But there were specific experiences from these trips that haunted him. Perhaps most infamous is the Parts Unknown episode on Sicily, featuring a so-called octopus and cuttlefishing excursion that turned out to be staged. The fishermen organizing the trip threw half-frozen, already dead seafood into the water with Bourdain, and the experience disturbed him greatly. He spent the rest of his trip blackout drunk and suffering from panic attacks. Oh, and did I mention that this was filmed on his birthday? I'm thinking, really? Are these prime fishing waters? I, I don't know about this, but I am famous for my optimism. So I dutifully suited up for what was advertised as a three hour cruise. So I get in the water and I'm paddling around and splash. Suddenly, there's a dead sea creature sinking slowly to the seabed in front of me. Are they kidding me? I'm thinking, can this be happening? Splash, there's another one. Another rigor mortis, half frozen freaking octopus. But it, it goes on. One dead cuttlefish, deceased octopus, frozen sea urchin after another, splash, splash, splash. Each specimen drops among the rocks or along the sea floor to be heroically discovered by Turi moments later and proudly shown off to camera. Like I'm not actually watching as his confederate in the next boat over hurls him into the water one after another. Later interviews highlighted the extent of his nervous breakdown. It wasn't funny to me down there where those dead octopi were splashing down behind my head. I felt like I was speaking in manic double speed for the next week. I couldn't breathe, my crew was very concerned, and there were some personnel changes afterwards. I'm still pissed about it. This is sort of a dangerous paradox about the shows over the years, where the producers understand that when things go really, really badly, it's comedy gold sometimes, but it's not fun for me. And then there were travel experiences that triggered ethical questions, and often intense depressive episodes. He knew that good intentions do not always equal good results. I'm there talking about local cuisine, okay, and I'm ch that means I'm shoveling food into my face in front of people that a lot of the, those people can't afford. Um, how, how do you deal with that? What do you do? Um, the person feeding you, obviously you remunerate them for their, for their efforts, for their food, for their labor, for whatever, we take care of them. But what about the, 
the people who are standing there who are hungry. And the, I think the human, you know, in, the, the immediate human inclination when you see hungry kids is, I, I will feed those kids. So I finish this, my soup, and I say, well, well let's buy out the place. We'll feed all, let's, you know, feed all of these kids, just what we did in Haiti. And as happens, things spin immediately out of control. The bigger kids shove the smaller kids out of the way. The grown-ups who were just as hungry come in and shove the big kids out of the way. And pretty soon you have a riot. A simple, maybe foolhardy, naive desire to take care of an immediate problem, hungry kids, led to unintended and very ugly consequences. You know, people beating other people. From his blog post on visiting the Congo, a nation and subject so large he regretted only dedicating an hour of television to it. No show I've ever made has been more difficult, more frustrating, more uncertain, maddening, or dangerous. We were extorted, detained, and threatened daily. I've had something of a multi-decade obsession with the Congo. It's been kind of a, a personal dream, if you will, to travel the Congo River. And now, for better or worse, get that chance. Blocked by officials, well, this could be months. And maybe his best episode of television ever, the one that changed his perspective on travel and the human condition, Beirut. It's often been remarked that Bourdain was hesitant to write tidy conclusions to his episodes. For Beirut, he was hesitant to write a voiceover, nor did he want an episode to air at all, thinking it would be exploitative if one did. Now joining us from New York is Tony Bourdain, He's the host of Anthony Bourdain, No Reservations on the Travel Channel. He's the chef and best-selling author. You were in Beirut shooting an episode of your show. What happened? Uh, well, I spent two really magical days of meeting uh, Beirutis, uh, all of whom were bursting with pride for a, a sort of new, resurgent, uh, relatively tolerant, westernized uh, Beirut. As it happened, uh, we were standing outside of the Hariri Memorial. Um, I was with a Sunni, a Shiite, and a Christian at the time when we started to hear gunfire and see uh, cars filled with Hezbollah supporters uh, celebrating the, uh, the capture or kidnapping of the Israeli soldiers. The look on the three faces of, of, of my companions was one of, of shame, uh, embarrassment, dismay, and, and a sort of resignation uh, as they all seemed to immediately get what, what inevitably was going to happen next. That's a great city, isn't it, Tony? It was a paradise. I'm, I'm heartbroken. As Lebanese writer Kim Gaddis wrote in her retrospective, growing up in Beirut during Lebanon's 15-year civil war, I wished for someone like Anthony Bourdain to tell the story of my country. A place ripped apart by violence, yes but also a country where people still drove through militia checkpoints just to gather for big Sunday family lunches, or dodge sniper fire to get their favorite butcher across town to sample some fresh, raw liver for breakfast. Perhaps he didn't know it then, but Lebanon would change him forever. In the episode, he talked about how he had come to Beirut to make a happy show about food and culture in a city that was regaining its reputation as the party capital of the Middle East. Instead, he found himself filming in a country that had tipped into war overnight. Filming on the day the violence broke out, he managed to capture that split second where people's faces fell as they realized their lives had been upended. Yet his reluctance makes the episode and its final monologue so harrowing. I wasn't in Haifa. I wasn't in the north of Israel. I don't know what that was like. I was in Beirut. In the few years since I've started a travelless world, I'd found myself changing. The cramped, cynical worldview of a man who'd only seen life through the narrow prism of the restaurant kitchen had altered. I'd been so many places, I'd met so many people from wildly divergent backgrounds, countries, and cultures. Everywhere I'd been, I'd, I'd been, as in Beirut, treated so well. I'd been the recipient of so many random acts of kindness from strangers. And I'd begun to think that no matter where I went or who I sat down with, that food and a few drinks seemed always to bring people together. That this planet was filled with basically good and decent people doing the best they could, if frequently under difficult circumstances. That the human animal was perhaps a better and nicer species than I'd once thought. 
I'd begun to believe that the dinner table was the great leveler, where people from opposite sides of the world could always sit down and talk and eat and drink, and if not solve all the world's problems, at least find for a time common ground. Now, I'm not so sure. Maybe the world's not like that at all. Maybe in the real world, the one without cameras and happy food and travel shows, everybody, the good and the bad together, are all crushed under the same terrible wheel. I hope, I really hope, I'm wrong about that. Bourdain's best work railed against the industries it was created for. He despised dishonest and tidy travel shows. The last book he wrote was intended as a travel guide written as someone who hated them. The sheer magnitude of his cultural impact became clear to me only after he died. Maybe the world could use another travel guide, full of Tony's acid wit and thoughtful observations, and a few sly revelations of the mysterious contours of his battered heart stitched together from all the brilliant and hilarious things he'd said and written about the world as he saw it. Food Network was a frequent source of derision, which makes sense considering Bourdain moved from Food Network to the Travel Channel and then to CNN due to interpersonal conflict, although I may have that timeline a little bit mixed up. Years after he left, Bourdain often criticized its shows and its chefs. But this in turn became his image and was exploited. Bourdain the contrarian, the erudite free thinker here to start drama and shit talk all his colleagues. The Holden Caulfield here to tell you that you're all a bunch of phonies. The beat poet here to advocate for societal change via obscenity. I was so supremely naive about so many things when I wrote Kitchen Confidential. My hatred for all things Food Network being just one of them. From my vantage point in a busy working kitchen, when I'd see Emeril and Bobby on the tube, they looked like creatures from another planet, bizarrely, artificially cheerful creatures in a candy-colored galaxy in no way resembling my own. They were as far from my experience or understanding as Barney the Purple Dinosaur or the saxophone stylings of Kenny G. The fact that people, strangers, seemed to love them, Emerald Studio audience, for instance, clapping and hooting with every mention of Gallic, only made me more hostile. Rachel Ray, predictably, symbolized everything I thought wrong, which is to say incomprehensible to me, about the brave new world of celebrity chefs, as she wasn't even one of us. Back then, hearing that title applied to just anyone in an apron was particularly angering. It burned. Still does a little. What a pitiable fool I was. And to be honest with myself, I never really hated Emeril, or Bobby, or even Rachel, as much as I found their shows ludicrous and somehow personally embarrassing. Publicly available information is murky, and I don't want to feed you misinformation, but overall, although I'm going to keep the specifics brief, it's clear that Bourdain's production schedules consumed most of his life, meaning that his life was in the hands of networks, many of whom he railed against. It was supposed to be a charmed existence, but the narrative that Bourdain got to travel the world and party for fun falls apart when you remember that there were always cameras and crews alongside him. It was work, work designed to push him to his limits. He tried to make the episodes more open-ended, intellectually challenging. He worked with auteur directors. He made it his mission to sit down for dinner in places few were allowed to. Myanmar, Gaza, Iran, Libya. While traveling, he was gracious. With executives, he bit the hand that fed. And the hand responded by commercializing him even harder. No reservations, no boundaries. Contractually obligated violations of privacy and comfort. Part of the reason I attempt to cover Bourdain as a flawed person and not an image is because a cottage industry has sprung up capitalizing on our idolization of Bourdain and grief over his death. Too much media about Bourdain is now dedicated to quote unquote solving his suicide rather than celebrating his life, works, writings, and ideas. It blames feminism and addiction for his death. It provides simple, socially acceptable answers to questions it would never dare to actually ask. No subversion, no inquiry. Shiny, deceptive products that play into the facade of Bourdain rather than deconstructing it. Perhaps the most egregious example of this is the recent documentary Roadrunner, directed by Morgan Neville, which I cannot in good conscience consider a respectful tribute. Rather, it is an exploitative conspiracy theory movie created for the Bourdain grief niche, a market currently catering to people like me. It's a tight, glossy doc that pays tribute to Bourdain's aesthetic inclinations well. But that's about it. 
In a practical way, I sympathize with the filmmakers who found out the hard way, like I did, how difficult it is to cover someone with such an expansive career and textured public persona. It's not easy in the slightest, and it's clear a genuine effort was made. I also admire unintentionally revealing aspects of the documentary. For example, we're meant to believe that Bourdain was notable and exceptional because he could make friends with anyone. Yet, almost everyone interviewed in Roadrunner is someone he met working in the food and entertainment industries. There are ethical questions to ask as well. At times, the film is narrated with a deep fake recreation of Bourdain's voice, created for the film with artificial intelligence. The film's director, Morgan Neville, told The New Yorker the technology is so convincing that audience members likely won't recognize which Bourdain quotes are artificial, adding, We can have a documentary ethics panel about it later. This was something Bourdain's ex-wife, Octavia Busia Bourdain, expressed disapproval of. I checked with his widow and his literary executor just to make sure people were cool with that. And they were like, Tony would have been cool with that. I wasn't putting words into his mouth. I was just trying to make them come alive. I certainly was not the one who said Tony would have been cool with that. Questionably, it also positions Bourdain's romantic relationships as replacing his addictions, and posits his relationship with Asia Argento as his last addiction. This feels disrespectful to the person who spent the last years of his life, as far as we know, drug-free. But it also feels lazy and morally bankrupt to narrow the complexities of Anthony Bourdain's life down to the thesis statement that he was a hopeless addict. What we do know for certain, as far as Anthony Bourdain is concerned, is that he loved Asia Argento passionately and identified as a feminist. The fact that their relationship is so often positioned as the cause of his death feels very much like the backlash we see against the girlfriends of rock stars. Neville freely lets Bourdain's grieving friends project their hurt and anger over his loss onto Argento, who, in a dark indulgence of Bourdain's references of rock cliché, is treated like a cross between Yoko Ono, harshing the crew's rapport on the episode of Parts Unknown that she directed, and Courtney Love, being held all but openly responsible for his death thanks to her tabloid scandals. It is hard to imagine Bourdain responding to this treatment of a woman he loved with anything less than fury, even if relationship stress contributed to a larger mental health struggle. Now, Anthony's ex-girlfriend, Asia Argento, speaks out to Daily Mail TV in her very first interview since his shocking suicide. They said I murdered him. People say I killed him. Asia Argento is reacting to the hateful comments and social media trolling she endured after the suicide death of her partner, Anthony Bourdain. I understand that the world needs to find a reason. I would like to find that reason too. He was so deeply loved. There were allegations that you had not been faithful to Anthony and of course people jumped on this. People need to think that he killed himself for something like this. He had cheated on me too. It wasn't a problem with us. He was a man who traveled 265 days a year. When we saw each other, we took really great pleasure in each other's presence. But we are not children. I cannot think of Anthony as somebody who would do an extreme gesture like this for something like that. What I do feel terrible about is that he had so much pain inside of him and I didn't see it. I did not see it. And for that, I will feel guilty for the rest of my life. It's also worth mentioning that the most exploitative grief niche content, including Roadrunner, does not adhere to journalistic standards of reporting on suicide. I understand that documentaries are entertainment, not journalism. But even as a YouTuber and one who's made lots of mistakes, I do try my best to talk about suicidality in a responsible manner that follows guidelines as much as possible. It's almost impossible to make a video on a figure like Anthony Bourdain without describing personal details. However, it is possible and encouraged to give context without oversimplifying or speculating on the reason for suicide. A documentary dedicated to outlining why Bourdain committed suicide, especially noting the increase in reported suicides after Bourdain's death, feels irresponsible. I am sincerely sorry for the heartbreak and pain of the grieving, furious friends featured here, and it appears to myself and other reviewers that their pain was exploited for pathos. Concisely, Neville employed their agonized interviews to illustrate a narrative rather than coming to conclusions about Bourdain based on their interviews. Perhaps this is no better seen in Roadrunner's very first interview, in which John Lurie asks how Neville can make a film about Bourdain since he, quote, committed suicide, the fucking asshole. 
Neville replies that he wants to make a film about why he was who he was. Yet the film shows us virtually nothing of Bourdain's life before he became famous, the majority of his time on Earth. The years in which he developed his love of writing and cooking are swept under the rug, but in Bourdain's own books, he talks about them frequently. Maybe this wouldn't matter if the documentary were strictly about Bourdain's life as a celebrity, but shouldn't a documentary attempting to define him as a person beyond his star image talk about more than his love of Iggy Pop? The idea that people commit suicide because of one person or event is not reflective of the reality that suicide often, if not usually, results from a lifetime of personal suffering, as well as long-term mental health struggles. Modern research shows that much like most of human behavior, it is multi-causal, not just the result of neurochemistry and genetics, but also socioeconomic pressures. Singular cause narratives are disrespectful to those who struggle with suicidal ideation. Partners can be complicated, unpleasant, or even abusive without being the direct singular cause of someone's death. As Mark Fisher wrote in Capitalist Realism, is there no alternative? The pandemic of mental anguish that afflicts our time cannot be properly understood or healed if viewed as a private problem suffered by damaged individuals. And I can't imagine how horrifying it must be to be blamed for a loved one's suicide, regardless of whether the relationship was fraught. I looked at everything she'd said in interviews after Tony died. I pretty much know what she'd say, which is that she loved him and felt misrepresented by people. I also knew, honestly, that to interview her, you would incur a lot of bad blood from lots of people in Tony's life. So there was a price to pay, too. There were so many things in their story that the moment you crack it open, all I would get is ten more questions. I get it, Morgan. Can I call you Morgan? You know, since you call Anthony Bourdain Tony without ever having met him. I get it, Morgan. Documentaries have to have central messages. Ten extra minutes, the length of time you said the Argento segment would last, can kill a film. But this is a film concerned with capturing Bourdain's personal life, a film that spends a lot of time talking about his addictions and mistakes, with interviews by so many people who knew him directly. I feel like your answer is not aligned with the inquisitive, uncompromising, messy kind of writing that Anthony Bourdain valued. Tony was an ultimate searcher and a seeker, but if you are really always seeking and always curious, then you can get lost. He had this tattoo that he got late in life that said in Greek, I am certain of nothing. That sounds very zen, but it's also a little sad. If you're truly certain of nothing and always looking for something, it means you're leaving everything behind at every moment. I think for Tony, that rootlessness ultimately disconnected him from the things he should be certain about, like the love of the people around him. Neville is just one of many who talks about Bourdain as if they were close personal friends, yet seems to misunderstand or misrepresent his values. The editing is glossy, the songs are well chosen, and it is difficult to watch friends of Bourdain's weep over the loss of someone they loved. The film drips with pathos, but a documentary should provide more than just pathos. It should ask the difficult questions with unflinching courage and curiosity. It should ask, as Maria Bustillos did in her recent Eater review of Roadrunner, questions like, to whom did Bourdain bequeath the royalties of Kitchen Confidential and why? How did his parents' divorce affect his views of marriage and success? In her article, Bustillos also details some of the flashier media events created to promote Roadrunner. In celebration of its premiere, a three-day pop-up at Leal was staged that served Resi-branded Negronis. The ending of the documentary, too, was staged. Artist David Cho, a close friend of Bourdain's, criticizes the idolatry received by artists who take their own lives, a sentiment I wholeheartedly agree with. A voice behind the camera says that there are murals of Bourdain downtown, so Cho and the crew head off to deface them in Bourdain's honor. While I like this ending in theory, as these sorts of Bourdain shrines are commonplace, Neville has since the film's release revealed that the mural scene in Roadrunner was commissioned by the documentary itself, something not revealed to the audience. Cho spray painted the mural and cut his hair, something he hadn't done since Bourdain's death at Neville's request. I can't speak for whether or not Cho found these acts valuable or cathartic, but I do think it's important to ask whether or not these were reasonable requests for a filmmaker to make of a grieving friend of the deceased. I have so many friends who've killed themselves. I have so many, fr like Bourdain asked me for help. He asked me for help, like, and I'm like, yes! What, what did he say? He said, I'm fucking miserable. He said, you're successful, I'm successful. Do you find yourself suffering? And I go, absolutely, please. And then I called him and, uh, and I, you know people that know Bourdain. I know yeah. his friends, I know his manager. You won't find a fucking person that will say a bad thing about him. But I'm like, you're a fucking asshole, dude. 
You're an asshole. You murdered yourself. You murdered yourself. You killed someone. That person happened to be you, but you couldn't even show up for yourself. You f I'm sorry. <laughs> Although I reiterate that documentaries are fundamentally entertainment, I nonetheless believe that documentary filmmaking should be always as ethical and compassionate as possible, leaving as little trace and hurting as few people as it can, it should uplift the humanity and artistry of its subjects. If Anthony Bourdain taught us anything, it's that. Alison Herman expressed this sentiment in her article discussing Neville's ethics. Roadrunner tries to capture Anthony Bourdain, but it does a better job of capturing what it means to admire someone and how admiration doesn't always do right by the admired. Which is why I center this video on my admiration of Bourdain rather than claiming to be some kind of arbiter of his legacy. I understand the compulsion to click on every video titled Anthony Bourdain's final interview. A lot of people are interested in the man behind the persona, but that creates a market. If you miss someone you never met, attempts will be made to sell you closure. In the brave new world of social media influencers and reality TV, an awareness of the artificiality of even the most authentic branded personality is taken for granted. Maybe more than that, people want, and even need, to know how someone so loved and admired could have slipped beyond the reach of friends, of help. And so the intense drive to understand the space between the genuine Bourdain and the Bourdain on camera grew. What Neville has attempted to do with Roadrunner is to close that gap. But he fails because the film, its subject, those who appear in it, and everyone involved, including all of us watching, are all drawn by it into the same superficial, risk-averse, obscurantist commercial machinery. The film about the dangers of the fishbowl cannot be made from inside the fishbowl. Of course, the grief niche does not end there. There are newsletters, podcasts, books, merch, reminiscences, and re-evaluations aplenty. These products serve not only to remember his life, but to retexture his star image. How could someone so beloved, so famously optimistic, commit suicide? The morbidly curious and heartbroken can find all the answers they desire in these Bourdain-branded products. It's the kind of consumerism Bourdain often railed against. The products are also a great way to control the narrative. What better way to defer scrutiny than artsy, determinist products about how Anthony Bourdain was destined to burn out like a shooting star? Products endorsed by people who really knew him. It's always worth asking, who's paying for this? And what is their motivation in presenting this narrative? This isn't to say that anyone involved had any malicious intent. And this isn't to say that exploiting a star's phobias and mental health episodes for views wasn't commonplace in the early 2000s, especially on reality TV. On the contrary, these practices were ubiquitous because the platform was relatively new and such activities and implications were not well codified nor examined. Mark Burnett, for example, understood that picking people without fame or money meant they couldn't possibly respond to onset abuses in any meaningful way. Fear Factor was perhaps the ultimate display of this, in which contestants were made to undergo dangerous stunts of physical and mental fortitude for the chance to win money. Similarly, former contestants of America's Next Top Model have spoken out in recent years about signing NDAs forbidding them to speak about their experiences on the show to the media and each other, experiences which often included intimidation, exhaustion, and injury. To be fair, despite being a reality TV star of sorts, Anthony Bourdain was not someone without fame, influence, or money. Some have argued that he had the ultimate agency in his situation because he could respond meaningfully to industry abuses in a way that others couldn't. I would counter that while we shouldn't coddle celebrities nor their memory, it can be very difficult for mentally unwell people under stressful circumstances to recognize their own agency. Many depend on others to take care of them in ways explicit and implicit alike. Part of the goal of feminism is to uplift the humanity of men as well, who may need extra assistance that does not fall under society's views of masculinity. I do not claim that Bourdain's higher-ups were criminally neglectful, nor that they had a legal obligation to care for Bourdain, 
but rather that it is morally questionable to take advantage of someone who is so obviously mentally ill, then after his death attempt to deflect valid criticism by portraying him as someone destined to commit suicide. Endless studies show, and the journalistic standard of reporting on suicide dictates, that suicide is preventable and should be portrayed as such. It doesn't take a genius to see loneliness echo throughout Bourdain's works. He expressed feeling tortured by the inauthenticity of his celebrity, by how little he felt like he was actually helping people or artistically contributing, by his mistakes along the way. He was relatively open about his pain, his mental illness, his addictions, and his relationships. He was thrown back into the water with the octopus. His righteous indignation played off as quirky comedy antics in post-production. The exploitative practices Bourdain wrote about are still commonplace, just less so on television. I think the next big reckoning with exploitation within entertainment will be creators on video sharing platforms like this one. Family channels on YouTube, TikTok dance accounts run by teenagers, creators reckoning with constant invasive harassment and abuses of power from platforms and media production enterprises who've barely begun themselves. Much like reality television of the early 2000s, there is much codifying and examining left to do when platforms are still so young and, as has been said before, claim to be your friends. The uh, diving for octopus scene was, was a genuine, genuine meltdown. It was my birthday. I think it was the last shoot of the season. I chose in Sicily because I, we already screwed up a Sicily show in a previous series, but I thought, you know, it's beautiful, the people are nice, the, the food's great. It's a good way to, you know, do a chill, easy-going show. And the minute I, you know, that octopus, that dead octopus started hitting the water around me, my, my sense of, of rage and self-disgust and, and just, I'm not gonna say I had a mental or nervous breakdown, but I came close. Um, and, and the implication explicit or not, from some of the people I was working with on that episode in particular, that I should play along with this horrendous manipulation of reality, that I should, you know, maybe hook a dead octopus and wag it around. I mean, look, he, look he's still peppy, he's still alive. What a triumphant day at sea, when in fact I wanted to murder everybody involved um, and then hang myself in the shower. It was a dark place, dark, very dark, low moment. Down. Love and lust. Down. All of us. Give me a run for my money. I get the feeling that dead celebrity deification has become more prominent in the era of quote-unquote cancel culture because dead celebrities can't suddenly hop onto Twitter and say racist things. Openly adoring living celebrities has, in many circles, become a faux pas. Best to be avoided lest they reveal themselves as the next J.K. Rowling or Joss Whedon, Louis C.K., Ricky Gervais, Dave Chappelle. But dead celebrities are no longer capable of bigotry and therefore parasocial betrayal, so all the good they do is amplified in our memory. Dead celebrities should not have the ability to form a cult of personality. Somewhere between unquestioned canonization and complete disownment, there must exist a plane for people we've never met, whether that be content creators, artists, musicians, or food and travel documentarians. It is the plane we must learn to navigate because a certain cultural sickness exists that is being exploited, a sickness that runs deeper than the individual phenomenon of parasocial relationships. Last year, when social media collectively learned the problematic reality of Bob Ross, I saw people on TikTok destroy and discard their Happy Little Trees merch. Coffee mugs, plushies, t-shirts, Christmas ornaments, even Monopoly boards. But perhaps the merch itself is the problem. Despite the legacy of Ross as a kitsch artist being not exactly unfriendly to such commercialization, According to Bob's son, Steve Ross, this image of Bob Ross as a fundamentally wholesome populist has been pushed by Annette and Walt Kowalski, his former business partners. I'll be referring to Bob and Steve by their first names for clarity purposes, but obviously it's not my usual practice. Steve claims that the Kowalskis attempted to pressure Bob on his deathbed to merchandise his name and likeness, and he refused. But through years of legal battle, the Kowalskis won the rights to merchandise their former business partner's legacy. The 2010 saw a wave of Bob Ross nostalgia, in part brought about by the clever marketing of the Kowalskis that catapulted him to saint-like status. But no member of the Ross family has permission to use his name, nor likeness. 
they don't make a cent for merchandise with his face on it. Who should be the arbiter of a celebrity or artist's legacy? The estate? The family? Friends? Fans? It's an important thing to question. The celebrity grief industry is neither new or exclusive to Bob Ross and Anthony Bourdain. In a recent article on outsider artist Henry Darger's estate, for example, the New York Times spoke to Ron Slattery, a Chicago art collector, advocating that artists' estates should be handled by their family, not former managers or landlords. But scholars of these same artists have their concerns over distant relatives having legal precedent over an artist's friends and contemporaries. These conundrums get even more complicated when discussing public legacy. Culturally, we venerate plenty of once famous people who are in truth flawed and troubled human beings. The issue, I think, comes with a sense of entitlement over their story, an entitlement that we often call love. But it's not love, and it can't be, since we never knew these people, right? A recent example of overstepping these parasocial bounds is Jamie Costa's viral so-called test footage for a Robin Williams biopic that does not exist. The video was made presumably to pitch Costa as the person who should play Williams when a Robin Williams biopic is inevitably made. Because of course there will be a Robin Williams biopic, we miss him. The scene chosen for the pseudo audition was the moment Williams learned his dear friend John Belushi had died. John Belushi died last night. They found him in his bungalow this morning. No. There are so many layers of awfulness here, but let's just break a few of them down. First, there's a the choice of scene, which is a Jenga tower of grief. The death of John Belushi, Williams grieving over Belushi's death, us retrospectively missing them both. Oh, how fleeting our time on earth suddenly seems. Make no mistake, this scene was filmed so people on the internet would go, oh my god, get this guy a movie, and of course they did. Thousands of people also spammed William's daughter, Zelda, with the footage to which she responded, Guys, I'm only saying this because I don't think it'll stop until I acknowledge it. Please stop sending me the test footage. I've seen it. Jamie is super talented. This isn't against him, but y'all spamming me an impression of my late dad on one of his saddest days is weird. It's definitely weird. As Kelly Conavoy wrote in her article, the Robin Williams test footage is weird. It is obviously weird to send video of an imitation of a dead person to the daughter of the person being imitated. And it's also weird to pitch a film to the social media masses with little more than a natural likeness and practiced imitation. It is weird to exploit the sadness around the loss of a beloved public figure without familial consent in a misguided attempt to force the hand of the industry. It is weird to use a grim scene to do so. It is weird to title the video test footage. It is weird to think that this is actually going to lead to you starring in a biopic about Robin Williams. And on a more technical level, I'm about to get shady. A good impression of someone's persona does not a solid dramatic performance make. There is a kind of enthusiasm Williams had in spades that is replaced here by volume and movement. Close your eyes and all kinds of images happen and it's really bizarre! And the impressions Costa does as Williams aren't solid either. Williams was, of course, an impressionist. I love that, but no, this is I was playing uh, Teddy Roosevelt in uh, actually a wax figure of Teddy Roosevelt that comes to life oh. in a movie called Night at the Museum. Yeah, but most of the photographs are in black and white. Yeah, I thought he had black and white hair. Yeah, and there's only, one, yeah. there's only one old movie of him basically walking around like, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> He wouldn't just sing A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes, he would have given you a spot-on or intentionally exaggerated Cinderella. If you ask Cinderella, she might sing it to you and say, Robin. A dream is a wish your heart Besides that, the scene itself is a mess. Choices made by both actors are quite on the nose, like her pacing around in the trailer to show that she is anxious about giving him the news despite entering the trailer explicitly to tell him the news. I'm working on my report on dreams. <laughs> Dream. And she's emotional set dressing, not a character in the way Williams is. She offers about one bewildered facial expression and Costa, despite what the headlines said, I don't think Costa embodies Williams. He sounds forced and unnatural. Voice is more than Tambra, nor does Costa connect with the person below the persona. 
He imitates how Williams acted on stage, doing impressions and telling jokes while receiving news of his friend's death. Uh, that might be how it played out in real life, but I'm willing to bet not, and it's not any of our business. This does not humanize Williams, it disregards the fact that he was a human being beyond persona who struggled with his mental health. Although Costa was later criticized for this video, which he appears to have since deleted from his own channel, so I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, that initial wave of Robin mania left a bad taste in my mouth. Another bizarre example from the past year is the widely panned Diana musical based on the life of Princess Diana, one of the most universally beloved figures of all time. Part of what made this musical so unpopular was the way it portrayed its protagonist, as not particularly refined or intelligent and mostly concerned with motherhood and fashion. All right, I'm no intellect, but maybe there's a discotheque where the prince could hear some prince and we'd all get funk and tell him. It also portrays Charles and Camilla, get this, as star-crossed lovers, desperate to reunite, and many regard them as the most sympathetic and interesting characters. I personally think Camilla got the best song in the show. Many watched and asked, did the crown pay for this? Is this a hit piece? <laughs> Although the devil doesn't need an advocate, I must remark that many people felt betrayed by this musical's interpretation of Diana's character because it does not align with her predominant star narrative. Charles and Camilla are often cast as villains in the public eye, and for good reason, but I'm sure in their private lives they perceive themselves as the star-crossed lovers the musical portrays. Fundamentally, Diana the Musical fails for many of the same reasons it's interesting. It is genuinely subversive, but fails to make us sympathize with the new narrative it may be trying to tell. But I'll concede on one point. The issue here isn't people feeling a parasocial connection to Robin Williams or Princess Diana. It's people feeling so entitled to their story and their persona that they try to force the hand of the industry. It's also important to remember that parasocial relationships are not a deliberate choice, rather a commonplace phenomenon in a media-heavy era. I also think it's worth looking at who the term parasocial seems to be most often directed at. Notice how criticisms of parasocial behavior never seem to be directed at, for example, men who commit acts of violence over their favorite sports team, but rather teenage girls getting excited for their favorite artist's new song. I can see the comments already. Well, I don't develop any attachments, unlike you, I am a good consumer. But I find it hard to believe that we're all as innocent as we purport. It's a journey. The internet personifies Roombas and Siri and the voice on the subway and routinely addresses how disappointed it feels when its favorite celebrities do questionable things. Pre Larson's NFT, for example, set Twitter on fire. I'm also a bit critical of the idea that most people have no particular feelings one way or the other for their favorite comedian or musician or artist. A flood of grief hit my For You page when the Gus Johnson controversy went down, hundreds of people saying things like, I always said to my husband that no matter how many celebrities were revealed to be problematic, at least we'd always have Gus. Now here we are. What you say? Oh, Garfield, we have a visitor. Don't tell me it's normal. It's normal. And don't even get me started on John Mulaney. It all feels frustratingly arbitrary and totally reliant on public knowledge. For example, many of the internet's favorites signed the 2009 petition demanding the release of Roman Polanski, charged in 1977 with sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl. Yet I still see endless praise for Harrison Ford, David Lynch, Tilda Swinton, Guillermo del Toro, Alfonso Cuaron, and Wes Anderson just about every day. But I guarantee that if one of them ever found themselves in hot water, the act of signing that petition would become a major part of their star narrative, dug up on social media and talked about to death, rather than being excused by fans as a mistake from another era, as the act currently is. Not you guys defending David Lynch when he literally signed the petition demanding the release of Roman Polanski. <sighs> 
Public knowledge is a greater good. Raising awareness is great. People aren't perfect. They make mistakes. All of these statements are true, but it's frustrating to see some people adored and some ripped apart despite having made the exact same mistake. There is little to no consistency or accountability. And as a survivor of violence, that's really frustrating. Beyond that, there are so many creatives who, like Bourdain, deliberately set out to make things about the human condition or try to find an angle of universality. It feels like bad faith criticism to ignore that everyone was supposed to be invited to his table. Beyond that, there are so many creators who set out to create the illusion of intimacy and relatability by sharing personal experiences, thereby pieces of their lives and hearts. The audience sharing in this is half of the intended experience. Illusion or not, we are compelled to participate. Or maybe I'm just a hopeless McLuhanist. This to say that parasociality is inevitable and expectations are manageable, but idol worship and commodification are actively harmful to ourselves and others. We can't let the signifier become the signified. We have to resist imitation and pantomime being sold to us as material reality. Pandemic life has, of course, been especially disenchanting in this regard. Okay, this is Dwight's second life. He's on it all the time. So much so that his little guy here has created his own world. It's called Second Second Life for those people who want to be removed even further from reality. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh my god, he's really in pain. Can't afford that Pinterest board interior you want? Build it in Animal Crossing, curate it in VR. Can't go out with your friends because there's a pandemic? Stay in and watch Parts Unknown starring your good pal who can never die so long as footage of him is preserved. The Facebook rebrand is banking on this exact concept. In the metaverse, you can purchase all the pictures of things that you want. Bourdain's episode on Sicily might have given us the perfect metaphor for that funny feeling. We are fishing for dead octopus, trying to convince ourselves that the illusion is reality, trying to salvage something tangible from the disaster for the sake of our mental well-being. So rather than policing the very existence of parasocial relationships on social media, a more important and material change would perhaps be to examine consumption habits and the way the entertainment industry preys on vulnerable people. I hope that's the era we're entering now. Critically reevaluating Robin Williams, Britney Spears, Alia, Marilyn Monroe, Brittany Murphy, Brendan Fraser, and endless others who have been chewed up and spat out. For other video essays in this vein, I recommend you check out Modern Girls Entertainment Media's History of Mistreating Young Women, Intellectual Media's A Short History of the American Celebrity, Mia Tequila's Amanda Bynes series, FD Signifier's The Commodification of Black Athletes, and Broey Deschanel's The Systemic Abuse of Celebrities. All are well worth a watch. As someone outside the fishbowl, I think the best way to remember Anthony Bourdain is by letting him tell his own story. He was an excellent writer and wordsmith. He found great pleasure in prose. In A Cook's Tour, he addressed the concept of becoming a commercial product. Medium Raw, meanwhile, spends a good deal of time trying to figure out how to raise a daughter in a misogynistic world. How can he teach her to hate McDonald's for the right reasons? Not because she should want to be skinny, but because she should experience all the different kinds of foods the world has to offer, because she should oppose imperialism in all forms, including culinary. Here are some other ways you could honor his life. Learn to cook. Bourdain considered learning basic cooking skills not just a virtue, vital, he believed vocally that every young person should learn. Hit up slash order from local hole-in-the-wall restaurants instead of ordering fast food. These often family-run businesses need your attention more than ever in this pandemic. Watch some classic and or independent films. Bourdain was a massive cinephile and some of his top favorites include The Friends of Eddie Coyle, Eyes Without a Face, The Battle of Algiers, Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence, Chunking Express, and Kiss Me Deadly. Of the ones she's seen, my cinephile friend Adequate Emily recommends them all. Learn to take good criticism from anyone. Bourdain often bragged about his daughter's fantastic palate and said if he wanted to know if a dish was too salty, he'd ask her. And of course, feel free to criticize me in the comments. Try new foods as often as possible. Have a meal with your family. Make someone you love breakfast. Speaking personally for a second, Bourdain's shows and books have made an extremely positive impact on my life. At the start of 2020, I was battling anemia and other debilitating side effects of undisclosed chronic illness. I had been vegetarian since age 10 due to contamination anxiety, 
I couldn't cook much, didn't know where to start, and was terrified to eat even well-done meat. For the sake of my health, my doctor recommended I incorporate more meat and fish into my diet, but I had no idea where to start. Since binging Parts Unknown, cooking has become one of my favorite hobbies. I almost never eat out anymore. I feel less sick and helpless in confronting undisclosed chronic illness. I cook dinner for my roommate virtually every night, and I'm even comfortable safely handling raw pork and poultry. Learning to cook has brought joy and peace of mind to my life in ways I never could have expected. I'm so immensely grateful for that. Sometimes I grow frustrated with loose ends in my own life. Ends that, if slightly different, would make for a more cohesive narrative. But I must agree with Bourdain. The desire to make life tidy is counterproductive and politically reductive. Everyone inevitably disappoints because everyone is human. Friends, loved ones, YouTubers, even celebrity chefs. But it's a gift and a blessing to be able to see people not just as idols or symbols, but as human beings. With bad habits, checkered pasts, and, as Bourdain put it, the nasty bits. We're all flawed and it's something to both grieve and celebrate. And moving forward, I'll try to live a life of flavor and complexity, a life in which the bitter, salty, spicy, and sour exist alongside the sweet. And the trick, I suspect, is not to focus on the sweet, but rather to accept that a memorable dish contains some inspired combination. Bon appetit. Feels the restless I am Beat my head against a pole Try to knock some sin down in my bone And even now they don't show The scars are so old And when they go They let you know You can't put your arm around a memory You can't put your arm around a memory You can't put your arm around a memory Don't try Just a bastard kid You got no name Cause you're living with me Where one and the same And even now they don't show The scars are so old And when they go They let you know Okay, you can't put your arm around a memory You can't put your arm around a memory You can't put your arm around a memory Don't try But don't try You can't put your arm around a memory You can't put your arm around a memory You can't put your arm around a memory Don't try If you love Anthony Bourdain, you might know that he had a lifelong love of sushi and a serious fascination with three-star Michelin chef Jiro Ono. You probably also know that his work often centered on documenting the history of food in places Americans aren't usually allowed to go, including all over Latin America. He was a huge fan of films that showed personal, profound journeys through food, society, and culture, like Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And if you're looking for your next favorite food documentary, I highly recommend Cuban Food Stories, which you can watch on CuriosityStream. This documentary by Asori Soto, created by the executive producers of Jiro Dreams of Sushi, attempts to find the truth of authentic Cuban cuisine, documenting a place and people most have a limited view of. After a decade of making films in the United States, Soto heads home to Cuba to reconnect with the food of his childhood and, more broadly, discover culinary traditions that shifted after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Soto's journey is heartfelt, with mouth-watering shots of delicious local foods and breathtaking views along the way. And if you're looking for the perfect place to watch more video essays like mine, whether about food or travel or media analysis, look no further than Streamy Award-nominated Nebula, a platform built by and for independent creators 
like Sarah Zed, Lily Alexander, and myself. While CuriosityStream offers big budget nonfiction videos, Nebula is a home for educational videos that are too spicy for YouTube. It's sort of like dining out and dining in. Sometimes it's fun to eat out, and sometimes what you really want is a home-cooked meal. But why choose when variety is the spice of life? If you use my code curiositystream.com slash Lola Sebastian, you can get Nebula and CuriosityStream in one convenient bundle. As long as you use CuriosityStream, Nebula comes free. And with the current discount promotion, you can get the annual plan for 26% off. That's just $14.79 for a video library with thousands of titles. If you use my code, you'll get a welcome email from Nebula granting you access. So what are you waiting for? Head to curiositystream.com slash Lola Sebastian for access to a whole world of new adventures. Everybody is highly opinionated, as it should be. And nobody's going to agree with anybody, only because yeah, well, way to agree. Any place where people argue about food is a good place. 